Dance fans and who dance from all over the world. It's time for the Bayou Blitz. With your host, Bob Rose. Good evening, New Orleans Saints fans, and welcome back to the Bayou Blitz. After a short vacation, we thank you for welcoming us back into your homes and radio waves. I hope everybody is having a spectacular 4th of July. Uh, joining me as always, or at least until he gets signed to a lucrative contract by the Golden State Warriors, is my backfield <laughs> mate, Kyle T. Mosley. How are you tonight, Mr. Mosley? Hey, what's going on? Oh, we can do what Boogie Cousins did. Oh, I'm just going to come along for the ride, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I figure uh, I, I figure I'll lose you when Golden State signs you, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll lose our special guest tonight, Mr. Barry Hurstis, when the Lakers sign him. Uh, so I'll, I'll be off on my own. I'll have to uh, venture up to Cleveland and join Mr. Mr. Max Stevens, and maybe the Cavaliers will welcome me, me in. Uh, but with that segue, we thank our very special guest tonight, uh, feature columnist for the Saints News Network, Mr. Barry Hurstis. How are you tonight, my friend? How are you doing, Bob? How, how's your uh, Fourth of July holiday been going? Uh, it's good. It's good. Um, we were talking before we uh, got on the air here. Uh, the little man who turns one in six days uh, saw his first fireworks show the other day, uh, and uh, mom and mom and son are going to sit out on the back deck when the fireworks start tonight, and then I'll join them when we wrap up. But uh, but yeah, it's it's real good. We got. Uh, we're finally getting a string of 90 plus degree days uh, that Kyle and I are always arguing about that you guys have to deal with on a regular basis down there. And I always say that I'll, uh, I'll trade your places any day while I'm getting what I wish for now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Look, but uh, look, I, I can assure you, <laughs> it, uh, you don't want to be down here. <laughs> but uh, uh, that said, uh, it, it's actually. Uh, hadn't been as bad uh, as as our, you know as you know I just moved back down here so uh, I, I I guess I, I missed being at home but uh, living in the Midwest uh, not far from where you guys were um, and, and then coming back after eight years you have to <laughs> there's a bit a bit of a readjustment period that you have to go through and uh, uh, I forgot just how brutal. It can be down here, and, and we're you know we just got into the month of July. We haven't even gotten to to, to the dog days, uh, so to speak, of August and September. So that, that'll be exciting. And of course, uh, I'll be out there uh, sweating at airline with everybody else watching this team. But um, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you're right. You will. You'll get uh, uh, you'll get to experience Saints training camp again. I know you missed that for a few years being uh, being out in the Midwest, uh, and as we all know. Uh, New Orleans spent half of their training camp prior to last year uh, for a three-year period of time up near me at the Greenbrier uh, for two weeks every summer. Yeah, I think it was about two weeks because I went uh, went for about a week uh, each of the three years. Um, and I remember having a brief conversation with Pierre Thomas in 2014, and I asked him, I said, hey, <laughs> how do you like the weather up here? Because he, of course, grew up in the Midwest, too. I asked him, hey, how do you like the weather up here compared to down in New Orleans? And he just kind of looked at me, um, and you know, he flashed that <laughs> grin of his, but he, he, he rolled his eyes and he said, oh, please, he goes, I hate those summers down there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it can be brutal, man. But look, uh, uh, you know, it is what it is, and, it, you know, it just comes with, it's all a part of life, but... Uh, uh, you know, these guys are professionals, so, I mean, you know, they, they, they'll get acclimated. Uh, it's always the it's always the hardest part for the rookies because, uh, yeah, as you alluded to with Pierre Thomas being a good example, these guys that have played, uh, the guys, for the guys that actually did grow up uh, in the Midwest or the North or out West or wherever they grew up at, uh, they, uh, uh, New Orleans in the summertime could be, can be quite quite a culture shock, let's say. I mean, it's already a culture shock just because of the because of the people itself. But then you get here to experience the weather and the, <laughs> on top of everything else that you have to experience uh, down here. And it's uh, I, I think it's a it, it's a, something they're a little bit taken aback by. <laughs> 
What kind of weather did uh, did the team have for mini camp? Because I know uh, I know the the heat and the humidity spiked down there a little bit earlier than what it usually does. Uh, I just I don't recall off the top of my yeah, head. It, I know it was probably running. It was probably running in the nineties. But you see, the thing about uh, practice, but if they schedule it, depending on when it's scheduled, if it's uh, let's say from eleven a.m. to one p.m., which is the schedule they were, were running on pretty much for mini camp. Uh, there's always that chance right around lunchtime or a little bit after lunchtime uh, where it starts to get overcast. And, and you know, a lot of times it'll, you'll just get what they call a pop-up thunderstorm down here. And it'll, and it'll pour down rain and then flood the streets for like an hour. And then, you know, uh, 10 minutes later, the sun's back out and drying out everything. So, uh, <laughs> so you get that, you get that a lot down here. So, uh, which is something else I'd forgotten about and got reminded of yesterday. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, so, so it just depends, uh, you know, uh, there, there's, there's a set, you know, when these guys put on full pads, and I always say it every year, you always separate the men from the boys when they put on full pads and it's just different training down here at yeah, the Greenbrier or, or even, uh, when they were in North Mississippi, uh, for those couple of years. It's just different when, when you're, you know, in, in, in the, in the, what, low 80s, uh, in the case of when you were in Greenbrier, you might even have days where you're in the 70s. So it's fantastic. Yeah, well, you're not going to get that down here. So between the, between the, the, the oppressiveness of the heat and the humidity, and then these guys got to wear a full pad, man. So that's, I, I, that's why I use that expression. You're, you're going to separate the men from the boys because the guys who are in really great shape and great conditioning physically are going to stand out and they're going to survive those type of conditions as opposed to the guys who, who aren't used to it. And those are the guys you usually see end up cramping up or they, you know, you know wind up uh, missing practice or whatever because they're just not ready for it. They're just not ready to deal with it. And, uh, and then, but, you know, uh, over time, though, you know, it's again. It's just rookies, basically. Uh, once they get acclimated, they'll be fine. Yeah, no question about it. And I mean, speaking from experience, because I've you know, uh, played for years on uh, pro am beach volleyball circuit. All you need to do is suffer severe hydrate dehydration one time, and I guarantee you that's the last time that you'll let that happen. <laughs> right. Right. All right. So. Um, um, uh, I'm privileged to join you tonight, of course, uh, if the listeners don't know, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, the long time connection between you and I at previous website. And, uh, and we even, uh, did the show briefly, uh, uh, together, I think, uh, one year or something, uh, with Kyle. So, so, you know, we have, we have a long time history, uh, uh, how far, you know, this is obviously you're the, you're the host and I'm the guest, but I'm going to ask you a question, which is how excited are you looking forward to this, this coming 2018 season? There's a lot of expectations, obviously, uh, you know, uh, Super Bowl, uh, you know, world championship expectations. And I, I you know, just speaking from my own personal experience, I, I don't believe I've been, you know, and I try not to, yeah, you know, I always emphasize this. I try not to cover the Saints from the perspective of being a homer, so to speak, because I just think that it, it lacks integrity. If, if you're serious about becoming a writer in our business and, and becoming a quote unquote journalist and not just a blogger, then you have to, you have to, you know, take it with, with the approach that um, you want to be considered a legitimate or, or, or a serious journalist. So by doing that, you can't be, you know, you can't, I, I, you can't uh, be a cheerleader for the team, so to speak, or, or at least I've never been. So I try to be as objective as possible. That said, as a New Orleans native, as a kid who grew up a Saints fan, you know, now an old 50, 51 year old guy, um, I, I've never been probably this, uh, uh, how should I say, eagerly anticipating uh, a season that I have this one. Just because uh, uh, maybe, maybe I would have been looking forward to 2012 if Bounty, if Bounty Gate wouldn't have happened because they were coming off that loss to the 49ers. 
and we clearly, clearly, they should have won the Super Bowl in 2011. I don't think any, mm-hmm. any, anybody that's been following this team for any length of time will tell you that that should have been their second Super Bowl title in 2011. So uh, I would have been, I, I personally would have been look for, looking forward to 2012 season had Bounty Gate not, not happened because then I, I think that 2012 team, as it was configured before it got, you know, uh, you know, Torn, torn apart by the suspensions, I think that 2012 team would have been a, a, a legit uh, top-rated Super Bowl contender that year. So I, so I certainly would have been looking forward to covering them then. But, you know, as we know, the, kind of, the whole thing, you know, 2013 was a decent year, but after that, pretty much the bottom fell out. And now we've got, you know, it, it's taken them this long to get back to the point where we're at right now at this very moment. So, uh, you know, it, so since that, it, it's been since that time, since the end of the 2011 season, that I've been this excited personally about the team. I, I, I guess there's, I, I know that was a big, long-winded explanation, but <laughs> I, 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 again, I just, I, I'm very excited about, about the prospects for this year's team. Uh, it, obviously, they're going to have to stay injury-free. Uh, they're going to have to, Ex, uh, on the field, uh, execute. You know, obviously, uh, you're gonna have to play, uh, try to play as much mistake-free football as possible as you possibly can, because ultimately that's gonna determine what wins and loses games. Besides your health and stay and remaining uh, injury-free it is going out. You know, and it's the team that doesn't turn the ball over that makes the less amount of mistakes. And uh, you know, so it's a fundamental thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But uh, uh, you know, to me, it's health. Uh, last year, you know, I mean, it's, uh, think about it. Uh, how many serious injuries did they have last year outside of Okafor? And I guess Anzalone and Klein at the end. Uh, if you think about it, they didn't have any. You know, they were relatively healthy for the entire year. So that's the first time that's happened in a while, because you can go back to 2014, 15, and 16. All three of those seasons, as bad as that defense was, they still had a key injury every single one of those years. Every single one of those years. Go back and look and see who they lost. You know, they lost C.J. Spiller. Or they lost, you know, uh, whoever. The, uh, I, I can't even think of the, the names off the top of my head. Jarius Bird. You know, you lost Jarius Bird. You lost C.J. You know, I'm not saying Jarius Bird and C.J. Spiller would have got them to the playoffs. I'm not saying that by yeah. any stretch. But but each season, you know, Del uh, Delvin Bro in 2016, uh, and uh, you know, and um, uh, the other guy, the other corner that they lost. So I did where they were bringing guys in off the street. So you know, so essentially, all three of those years, 2014, 2015, 2016, they lost uh, a key, vitally important player, uh, for the team that particular season. Uh, you know, would would CJ Spiller have been a uh, been a breakout player in 2015? Maybe, maybe you wouldn't have, but we we never got to find out, <laughs> you know. And it's, and he pretty much essentially turned out to be a bust, and, you know. So anyway, the, long story short, this team uh, essentially was wandering out in the desert, so to speak. Uh, and you know, but they, give them credit, give them credit. They've they've done a masterful job, a masterful job of rebuilding within. You know, without having to scrap the roster and starting over from fresh, they basically did a, a I don't know what you would call it, a, 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 a in-season rebuild, so to speak, uh, starting in 2015 with J- Jimmy Graham train and the Max Unger deal and the whole thing and that draft, because actually that was Ireland's first draft, even though it, uh, he's had a few guys uh, notably wash out from that first draft. But that's where it all started, and ever since then, it's been money. I mean, those guys have been money. So uh, that's what's turned it around, and uh, give them credit for it. They deserve it. So, uh, and, and, you know, and here we are. Here we are now. We're a team that's good enough, legitimately good enough, to contend for a world championship. And that's all you can add. If you're a Saints fan, especially if you're an old guy like me that grew up with the team and, and, and been through it, you know, inception essentially, and you know, watching them get destroyed 
when you as a little kid, when they just had really bad, bad teams in those days in the 1970s, early 70s when I grew up with it. Uh, you know, so to see, to see him uh, contend for a world championship, it, if you're an older guy like me, it, it's just marvelous. You know, I, I, just, I and I'm not even talking about just winning the thing in 2009. I'm talking about the entire Sean, Sean Payton, Drew Brees era uh, in general and as a whole. Yeah, you just got to be excited that, that they've had this much success and that they're still, still legitimate world championship contenders after all this time. Yeah, they've had some rough patches, no question about it. You know, 2007, 2008 were, were kind of rough. You know, obviously Bounty Gate was rough, and then the, the, this little stretch of years we just got through discussing. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's seen its shares of ups and downs. Let's not, let, let's not oversell it. But overall, these guys have been – very successful in the decade that they've been in power or, and had Breeze uh, as their starting quarterback. And uh, look, I mean, what more could you ask for? They got a Breeze personally has a chance to ride off into the sunset. I mean, that's what every NFL player dreams of doing. Peyton Manning got to do it just a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, Tom Brady could have done it. I guess he's going to keep playing. I don't know uh, how long that's going to uh, keep on, but. But I think in Drew's case, I, I think if he won it, I think if the, I think if the Saints won the Super Bowl this year, I think Brees would re, would retire. Retire. I really do. I, I I can't say that with a great degree of certainty because he might say the heck with it and come back because he's just such a competitive guy. But I personally, I feel that like if the Saints won the Super Bowl this year, he would retire. But you know, we'll we'll see how it ha- We'll see what happens. Uh, but you got to get there first. So. <laughs> right, that that's a hell of a hot take. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, at, at, as it is, whenever you talk about a 38 year old quarterback, uh, as we have the last few years, you know, we talk about what this, what are the Saints going to do? How are we going to feel when Mr. Breeze steps off into the sunset? How are they going to do before uh, before Drew decides to hang it up and everything like that? Uh, and, you know, we won't hold you to that prediction, Barry, but there is something to be said. Uh, you know, you mentioned Peyton Manning. Uh, you go back a little bit before that, uh, different position, uh, but Jerome Bettis hung it up as he was getting up there in years um, uh, as yeah. running back of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And a guy that I idolized growing up, John Elway, stepped, uh, stepped back after two straight championships yeah. with the Denver Broncos. So it's certainly not unprecedented. Uh can I say Personally, something? Personally, I think. Go ahead. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It's not unprecedented. It is correct. And when you look at what's happening with his career, and I think a lot of Saints fans are starting to feel it, Barry and Bob, is that how much longer can we have such an elite quarterback like <clears throat> Drew Brees remaining he- remaining healthy and playing at the the level he's playing at? How can we keep letting that talent go to waste? And I really, and I have to echo what you're saying, Barry, as far as the excitement level level uh, with this p- team and the potential is there. Uh, but with all great teams, you you mentioned it as well. Health is the major concern, right? And can Drew Brees be one of those guys going off and riding off into the sunset? We shall see, <laughs> you know, uh, that's my prayer for right. him. And I, I believe if we are able to have these young guys uh, keep performing at a, at a high level and the front office keep bringing in talent uh, off the street or through free agency, I think we can see a couple of championships on the board for New Orleans with Drew Brees still being here. But I really have to, to be honest with you, can we keep him another two past two years? I don't know if if that's going to be the case. Yeah, well, yeah, I think yeah, uh, I, I do. Well, go ahead, go ahead. I, I apologize. Uh, I, I think, and you bring up a, a great point, Kyle. You know, we're not now now necessarily talking about one championship, uh, but this team and the three of us have all mentioned it separately and together before. Uh, this team has built itself 
for a for a long haul as far as a championship contention. When you look down the roster and you see how many of uh, of these guys are second and third year pros and 25 or under. Uh, and I think in part, I think that's also rejuvenated uh, Drew, who is as competitive a guy as you can get. Uh, so say they do win the championship this year. I personally don't think, and I'm not ruling out your suggestion, Barry, uh, but I personally don't think that Drew would step away because of the talent that's built up around him. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah. number one. Number two is the man is a football historian, too. Uh, he is going to pass Peyton Manning for the all-time uh, passing yardage yeah. list very early in the season. Uh, but... He also is within striking distance of Manning's career t- you know, uh, top career touchdown record too. Realistically, right. he's not going to get it this year. I think he had to, he'd have to throw like fifty two touchdowns or something like that. Uh, right. But he if he has a Drew Brees type of year this year and next year, he's sitting at the top of that list too. So I think he's very aware of that, and he's never been a stats first kind of guy. Uh, but I, I think when you take in that whole package. Uh, and he's going to obviously, as he probably does every year now, uh, he sits down with his wife, sits down uh, and you know, takes into consideration his kids and his own physical health. Uh, and the man takes phenomenal care of himself. Uh, and while I'm not ruling out the possibility that he could step away, uh, we're talking about further cementing a Hall of Fame legacy. I mean, he's already a first ballot. Uh, and for some, yet, for some reason, uh, people don't talk about him in the top two, three, five quarterbacks yeah. of all time. He wins a couple qu- titles in a row. I think that conversation changes. Yeah. Oh, no question. And, and, and this is kind of a little bit off topic, but and Kyle, you can jump in here on this too. But uh, and this directly talk, cor- ties in uh, correlation to what, uh, what you were joking about at the beginning of the show with Boogie Cousins, which is. The city of New Orleans and the community, or, or the community, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, terminology you want to use, I just we'll just go ahead and call it the city of New Orleans. Uh, is a small market, uh, as we know, uh, by by professional sports standards. I cannot tell you how often, and, and we clearly saw it with this whole LeBron James and Boogie Cousins stuff and all this stuff over the last week. Where how many times did you actually hear the Pelicans mention? How many times did they ever say what a Pel? I mean, Pelicans got Rondo and Cousins and uh, De- um, uh, Anthony Davis on the same team, but you never heard once about LeBron even considering. You heard him mention every team, even mentioned Denver Nuggets. I mean, the Denver Nuggets, okay? Who to me aren't uh, uh, you know they're below the Pelicans in the pecking order. And yet they were talking about, uh, you know, the, the, they were saying, well, give us some wild cards. So they mentioned the, the Denver Nuggets, and um, uh, obviously they were going to throw Oklahoma City in there because of pa- Paul George and R- Russell Westbrook. So long story short, the Pelicans never, never came up in the conversation. Never, not even once, didn't even mention it until, until the Boogie Cousins thing went down. Then, then the Pelicans were over, all over the news, but for a bad reason. My point being this. Think about how many times in the NFL last year, or even now, this in this current offseason, how many times, think about when they talk about the NFC contenders. Who are they talking about? They're talking about the Eagles defending champs. Mm-hmm. They're talking about Minnesota because we all know Minnesota is right there. They were in the NFC championship game last year and obviously beat the Saints in the playoffs and did what they did. But, you know, they have a – Fantastic defense, uh, probably the best defense in the league. Uh, arguably, maybe the one of the best in quite some time, uh, or potentially wise. Anyway, so I get I get the respect that the Vikings get. You know, uh, the Rams. You know, everybody's talking about them because of all the big moves they made in the offseason. They traded for Brandon Cooks. You know, of course they got Aaron Donald, who might be the most dominant player, uh, defensive player in the game. Long story short. You always hear them talking about the Rams and the Eagles, even the Falcons. We even hear about Matt, Matt, Matty Ice and, uh, and all the great weapons he's got now. And now Calvin Ridley is going to be playing with Julio Jones and this unstoppable, uh, you know, roster that the Falcons have assembled. You know, uh, I guess they're the favorites. They're, you know, what about the team that won the division last year? You know, what about them? They still got a good team. 
<laughs> they got a good roster. You know, team was only 10 seconds away from the Super Bowl last year. Drew Brees is still the quarterback. He's not hurt. You know, he's still, still playing at a high level. My point being, why would you not acknowledge that? Why would you not acknowledge, just like you wouldn't, why would you not acknowledge the Pelicans have Anthony Davis, a top five NBA player, maybe a top three, you know? So why wouldn't you even at least mention the fact that, hey, maybe LeBron would actually consider, no, I'm not suggesting that he would have ever came to the Pelicans. But my point being the talking heads, especially those at ESPN, and I'll mention them by name because we're on our show. We're not on anybody else's <laughs> show. So I'll, I'll say it and say it freely. The bias against the city, I don't know why. Is it because they're a small market? I don't know. Is it because they don't take New Orleans serious because it's a, a quote-unquote party town and it's not a corporate, you know, a, a, a place of, where you have a, a high place of um, corporate business like, like a Los Angeles or New York, Chicago, Houston, whatever. Uh, New Orleans, it doesn't have that reputation. We, uh, what, they have, what, one, <laughs> I think, a Fortune 500 company in the entire city, uh, which is Entergy, I think, the um, – the uh, power uh, company down here. So, I mean, I mean, give me, give me some more legitimate reasons why you wouldn't mention uh, if you're the ESPN or just whoever, why you wouldn't mention the Pelicans and Anthony Davis. It's, it's not like, you know, Hey, they play. Uh, there's some team in that arena playing 41 games every year. There's some uh, team that, that was what the third or fourth best team in the Western conference last year, but you, but they can't even warrant a mention. Come on, man. So, uh, and, and it's been the same way with the Saints. So, uh, sorry to go on this big long rant and uh, tangent that I have, but my point is that uh, I don't think it's just so much that uh, it, it's a disrespect against the Saints, so much it's an even bigger bias or disrespect against New Orleans. Why that is, I don't understand. But clearly, clearly, in these last few months, and especially this week in particular with the NBA uh, free agency, we have seen the, this this city and, and this uh, well, this Pelicans Saints fan base. I would you know they're probably pretty much the same. Uh, there's different there's different uh, there's more Saints fans and a wider a wider uh, scope of Saints fans nationwide than there are Pelicans. Pelicans are pretty much regulated, I would say, to the New Orleans area, but. Uh, but in, e- in either case, uh, just passionate fans, great, great fans. And, and, and the fact that they are essentially overlooked or, or ignored, basically, by the national media, it, it's criminal. It's absolutely criminal, in my opinion. And uh, trust me, if I ever get my foot in the door nationally, I would be one of the people there that, that would be trying to change that narrative. But I, I, again, I don't know why. And then, and then, you know, when you get a guy like Boogie Cousins being so disingenuous and, you know, basically outright lying and saying that he didn't even get an offer, and you come to find out 24 hours later he got, you know, offered $40 million. <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, uh, you know, where it just seems to be uh, one, a, uh, n- maybe not a bias, but, uh, maybe it's unintentional, but it always just seems that the Saints, the Pelicans, the City of New Orleans in general always seem to get slighted or overlooked or just whatever. And, and you know what? And, and that's the kind of stuff that, that I hope that, 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 uh, the, the, the teams themselves, the organizations themselves take to heart because I can assure you as a native of this, of this city, uh, it irks me. Like I said, I try to be, as unbiased and I try to call things down the middle and, and you know, I, I know we covered this. It, we were called the saints news network for a reason because we covered the New Orleans Saints. So I could certainly cover it uh, with black and gold sunglasses on and, 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 you know, and, and put who that and all my articles and, and be a big cheerleader for the team. But that's not what, that's not what real football fans want. I mean, I mean if you're a real, I, I know there's some fans that could care less. They, all they want to know is black and gold this and, and, and who that. And that's great. I love it. You know, I, I, if that's what makes you happy, then by all means, go ahead. But for the not for the fans that are very knowledgeable and, and, and really into the sport, 
and uh, take everything serious. You know, they appreciate, uh, you know, they appreciate uh, somebody telling them like it is, uh, you know, you can't sugarcoat everything. I, 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 I and I'm, you know, as much as I'd love to make, make every story, a, uh, a black and gold, uh, uh, um, uh, experience, sometimes you just got to call it what it is and, 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 and tell the truth. So, you know, that, that's, that's the way, that's the perspective I've always tried to cover this team from. Uh, and you know, as critical as I've been of them in the past, I give them praise when they're doing good. And I got nothing but praise for them right now. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Could, uh, could, could they do, could there be some better things? Sure. But man, you know, all, all in all, to, to to be where they're at right now, it's very exciting to see, uh, and uh, and I look forward, you know, uh, and especially now that I'm back home, uh, I'm really, really anticipating this uh, this season more so than uh, many in the in the past. Yeah, and I think uh, I I agree with both of you that the team the team flat out is one of the most serious contenders coming out of the NFC for the Super Bowl. Uh, it it does irk me that the talking heads don't necessarily talk about uh, the Saints in the yeah, first breath. I mean, you know, uh, they mention the the Vikings and everybody else, but I, I mean, do you, am, I, am, I, am I overstating that? Do you two uh, do both yeah. of you see that? Well, I'm gonna say it like this, guys. We know what we have in our team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And yeah. Definitely. I would rather these guys do what we should see them do, prove it on the field. And the sexy picks in the people who produce shows on the East Coast and the West Coast would always gravitate to the popular talks. You know, I I read a story saying um, (laughs) that Drew Brees is not even in some people's minds considered one of the top 10 best players in the national football league. And I'm thinking (laughs) these guys really, really have not seen him play. Right. Right. And (laughs) then you start listening to the rhetoric of who's the best and no knock against Aaron Rodgers, no knock against Tom Brady. Brady always proves that he can take his team to the Super Bowl. But in, uh, in my opinion, the AFC is in an inferior type of uh, yeah. <laughs> conference. Yeah. And he, he's in a conference, um, uh, sub-conference with his division that's pretty inferior as well. There's no re- really no one – challenging those guys on a consistent basis uh to take a home field advantage away from uh the from new england with all that being said i'm saying this we can be concerned about who said this and who said that but what i i actually believe is that we're going to see on the field, how Sean Payton and this team is going to be comprised and how well they're going to execute. And I think the talent they have brought in is proof positive that we are going to have something to talk about in January, late January this year. I really believe of uh, 2019, I should say. So, I'm not too concerned about the the national media. Uh, I did a poll last week, uh, and I and I asked to the Saints fans, uh, who do you like to hear from, the beat writers of the Saints or uh, the national media guys? And it was overwhelming. Ninety seven percent said wow. they like to hear from us versus wow. them. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I don't think we're ever going to get that uh, credit, guys. And, you know, and think about what LeBron did. And you're going – of course he's going to go to L.A. More money out there. More more recognition. Yeah. More Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood has more to offer him than what New Orleans could have offered to him, especially this late in his <laughs> career. I mean, we're really seeing the, the sunset of his career as well. So, right. I mean, with all the talent he has – you know, and I think LeBron is kind of similar to Drew Brees. All the talent he that is a it, that he possess as a athlete, 
well, do you have the right pieces around you? And I think this year we have the right pieces that are being put in place by Sean Payton and those guys in the front office. Yeah. Yeah. And look, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, no, uh, I, 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 go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I was going to kind of echo what Kyle was saying. Uh, but, but then I remembered you, you want to discuss my observations at many camps. So I'll wait, but cause my lead in was going to be Davenport. And, uh, cause he looks great. I, 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 even with the, but the bad thumb and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. I'll let you finish your thought, but, uh, that kid's the real deal. Yeah, that's, that's actually exciting to hear. Uh, and, you know, we definitely <laughs> want to get your, uh, get your thoughts and your, your observations at mini camp. Uh, and, you know, Saints fans just, just so you understand. Mini camp and OTAs, they are not contact drills whatsoever. Uh, it's basically glorified seven on seven football. Uh, so you're not going to see a whole lot from, you know, your, your line. You're not going to see a whole lot of physical play. Uh, the thing to pay attention to when you, you know, when you're there and even when you go to certain aspects of training camp, uh, is the, uh, progression that your quarterbacks you know, how smooth your quarterbacks look in their you know, in their releases and as they go through their progressions. Uh, my favorite battles, individual battles to watch, have always been wide receiver versus cornerbacks. Uh, that's something that you could really take away from. Uh, and they do. Uh, they used to call them Oklahoma drills, but that's when they were a lot more physical back in the day. Uh, but you can get a good feel for what kind of pass rushers that you have on the team and the one-on-one blocking abilities of the offensive tackles and offensive guards when they do those drills off to the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with, you know, with that, and that's what I mentioned, and Davenport is a perfect segue, uh, we were curious about what kind of things stood out to you at the Saints mini camp last month. Uh, well, it's certainly Davenport. Uh, you know, as we know, he had the, um, the thumb surgery on the ligament. Uh, I think it was po- Partially torn, I guess. Uh, we never did really get the full explanation of what happened to the thumb, but my guess is that he uh, partially uh, tore the ligament in there, but it wasn't anything major and just needed a little corrective surgery and uh, basically just need to, you know, not do anything with it for six weeks, uh, six to eight weeks, and then it'll be fully healed. So he'll, he'll be, uh, uh, I would imagine that that first padded practice probably won't be to about the. 28th, I think, which is that first Saturday. So I don't know if he'll be in pads on the 28th, but uh, I would imagine we will probably see him in the first pre. I'll be shocked if we don't see him in the first preseason game against Jacksonville. We, we might not. I don't know. It all depends on you know what their what their prognosis is and and how you know because there's no rush. I mean, you know, you don't want to uh, you know. I mean, he's a rookie. You can let him develop at his own pace, but. Uh, I would imagine he'll probably play in that first preseason game, uh, assuming it's healed by then, because it'll be right on that timetable. Uh, that said, man, look, even with the thumb being what it was, uh, I, there was a play where, you know, there were team drills and, and um, you know, when they basically go on, uh, you know, full scale at the end of pra- each practice. Uh, they, only, they only practiced twice, and technically they only really had one one legit, legitimate practice where you where they were you know going at it uh you know full pace basically uh again as you alluded to they're not wearing pads it's basically it's touch football basically uh is what i would describe it as um but that said uh man that was teron armstead he blew away i mean that wasn't just anybody it wasn't you know it wasn't one of these uh undrafted guys i mean this was teron armstead so he blew him up again. They weren't in pads. Or, you know, uh, you know, what, what, what do you do that to, to uh, you know, what do you do that to Tampa Bay's uh, offensive tackle in Week One? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. But uh, I'm, I'm just telling you, just based on the on the small glimpse that I got of this kid, he's the real deal. I mean, he's phenomenal. When you see him up close, I, I mean, he, when, when you hear the term. <laughs> when you hear the term freak of nature, he really is a freak of nature. That's not an exaggeration. I mean, he, he's just, man, uh, very impressive looking athlete. And, um, I, I, I mean, I, I, there, there's not enough, <laughs> there's not enough terms I can use 
uh, that that accurately describe uh, how impressive he is. He he just he just looks he looks every bit of the prototypical. Uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, of the prototypical pass rusher. I, I don't know what what some of the current uh, Khalil Mack or uh, Shaq Lawson or somebody. I don't know. I don't even know what I don't even know which players. Because I'm so immersed in the Saints, I barely pay attention to half the other teams that players have. Because I'm just immersed in the Saints until that until that week's upon it, then I pay attention. I guess. Uh, but long story short, he's your prototypical edge rusher, pass rushing uh, defensive end coming off the outside edge. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, I'm trying to think of a Saints player I'd rank uh, or compare, make a comparison to in the past. I really can't think of anybody. Uh, like I said, he, I guess uh, Khalil Mack would be who I would think of right now as, as who he reminds me of. Or Jadavian Clowney, maybe. Uh, and he's been compared to Jadavian Clowney, I think, uh, by a few people as well. So um, uh, he, he's just that prototype edge rusher. Uh, and uh, I think he's going to be a phenomenal talent. I, I, I know there's concerns. You know, he only played, uh, you know, University of Texas San Antonio, which a lot of people don't consider to be exactly high caliber competition you know it's not like it was the sec i and i get that or the or the pac-12 or whatever but uh, I, I i i don't think that's such a big deal you know it, it would be different if you played at a you know if you played at a division three school you know then you'd say okay well we got to see this guy but, but you know <laughs> so, what barry but, barry, but, yeah. barry one one thing about that man he played they played texas a&m they played Baylor. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and played they, well. Yeah, they yeah. weren't playing <laughs> scrub yeah. schools at all. So. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. But I, I just be – there's this there's this thing, though, Kyle, nationally that I perceive anyway, because I've picked up on it from several scouts and, and, and analysts. And, you know, you're basically a lot, a lot of your guys with NFL.com especially – Hey, I, I hate Sigma organizations, but again, this is our show, so I'm going to call their ass out on this show. And uh, uh, NFL.com has this huge issue with the Saint pick of Davenport. I don't know why, but and, and, and a lot of it, it seems to be centered around the fact that he played at Texas San Antonio. So you know, I'm sorry it wasn't. I'm sorry it wasn't uh, USC. I'm sorry it wasn't Florida State. But the kids got talent. Which you know what, man? The talent is undeniable. It's look, undeniable. The, you see look, him dripping look. off this kid. Yeah, and, and Barry, this is what gets me about national media a lot of times is the fact that you look at a guy now like Michael Strahan, which is a Hall of Fame defensive end, right? What school did he attend? Texas Southern University. That's right. Okay, Smalls. Historically black college located right here in Houston, Texas. So yep. it wasn't a big name school. You know, <laughs> it doesn't really matter to me, guys, and Bob and Barry, and, and, I, and I think Coach would have echoed this a long time ago, Coach Rick Gailey, and we're going to talk about him. It doesn't yeah. matter what the guy – what school he comes from it it only matters what he does on the field <laughs> right when right. when they're given the opportunity right so yeah how Absolutely. many small or uh, undrafted free agents have become hall of fame players right mm -hmm. sure. you know look at the career that we uh we have from pierre thomas and look where he's going into the Saints oh. Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. I only it what matters is is he going to be able to learn? Is he smart enough? Is he capable uh, uh, capable enough? Does he have the talent enough to be able to produce the numbers that we need him to produce on the field? Forget the school. Yeah. Too many guys come from big schools do nothing. Nothing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, 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 or just become total bust out right. So I, yeah, I definitely agree in that sense. But uh, there today, anyway, yeah, that 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 was my observation. That, that he he's a phenomenal talent. He again, he blew away Teron Armstead like he wasn't even there. And, and you know, is that a concern for Teron Armstead? No, nah, I don't think so. I just it was just <laughs> it was just one play. So I, I you know, 
I'm sure Teron Armstead's fine. Well, uh, you know, God, God, God forbid there's something wrong with him. I don't, I don't think there's a regret. Because I had somebody ask me uh, um, on Facebook, did I, did I consider that uh, maybe Armstead's regressing? I was like, no, he just, <laughs> he just got, the kid just beat him. That's all. The kid just beat him. That's all there is to it. I mean, that's how good Davenport is, in my opinion. That he that he that he beat a, a what fifth year NFL veteran one of the best left tackles in the league. <laughs> and he, uh, yeah, it's just one play in practice with no pads on, but it was impressive nevertheless. So much so that everybody was speaking about it. Everybody was oohing and on, and you know it was the main thing I wrote about when I got home that day that that afternoon because that was the thing I remembered most. So uh, yeah, he's the real deal. Uh, let's wait to the preseason games and training camp, and before we get excited, I don't, I don't know, I don't want people that's listening to get hyped up just because of what I told you. But that said, yes, he's phenomenal. He he looks to be every bit the player that uh, is. Is he going to be worth a, a 2019 draft pick? Uh, giving up that extra draft pick for? I can't tell you that right now. I I, I don't want to make any predictions. But just based on what I've on the small sample size that I've gotten so far, yes, he will be. And, and you look, if they if they got their edge rusher to compliment Cam Jordan, watch out. Because that's what they were lacking. You know, that's one of the things they were really lacking. That and uh, faster linebacker play, which we'll get to later too, um, uh, which they've gotten now with Demario Davis. And, and if, uh, Angeloni co- if Angeloni comes back healthy and can stay on the field, man, then all of a sudden your linebackers are faster than they're ever – and then you pretty much covered almost every hole you got. The only real hole left of the team would be tight end, and that's no, and that's not really a hole. It's just not as good as a. It's just not as good as it can be. I mean, yeah, Ben, ben Watson can still play, but you know, you you you'd much rather have a, a younger guy in there. We'll see if Yelder can, can step up. Uh, I didn't even get to see him practice because he didn't he didn't uh, participate. So uh, that was one of the. Uh, we'll, that, I guess I'll cover some of my bigger disappointments uh, in minicamp before I get uh, to Taysom Hill, uh, which was the other player that stood out. Uh, well, there's a couple more players. Let me, let me let me cover the players first that stood out. Obviously, Davenport. Uh, I'll save Taysom Hill for last. Um, uh, another player that stood out without a doubt was Demario Davis. There was one play where uh, they they – they disguised, uh, you know, they drew, uh, drew was calling a play at the line and uh, defense were, you know, cr- creeping up to the line. And then when the ball was stopped, they blitzed. And Demario Davis was the guy who blitzed. And man, <laughs> he was in there so fast. I don't remember who was supposed to pick him up on that play, but they didn't pick him up. They had no shot. He was pretty blue, blue clean past him. Again, no pads, practice. Not a game, you know. They're not playing the game speed. It's not, you know. They're not. It's not live tackling. But man, we, they, 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 the word was that they signed Davis because he's fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's fast, all right. And he's twenty nine. So think about it. This guy's twenty nine, or he's almost thirty, and he's still that fast. So that's you know, we're, we're, how long? How longer can he still remain? I mean, <clears throat> you got Ted Ginn Jr. still running pretty fast at thirty three. So can Davis run, you know, that fast for a couple more years? I sure hope so because, man, he was for a twenty-nine-year-old guy, he was moving. So, well, uh, so I think they signed him to a four-year contract. So we only need him to be fast for four years. Well, there you go, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but he but he was he stood out. Obviously, he he was phenomenal. Um, uh, I want to say, uh, actually, Trayvon Durrell looked good to me. Uh, you know, he, he didn't. You know, he didn't make any spectacular plays, but he, but he, but he caught some. Uh, you know, everything that went his way, he caught it. Last year, he was dropping all those balls. This year, he's catching them. So again, it's just practice. He, you know, he was. He didn't was like he had Marshawn Lattimore covering him or nothing. <laughs> but it, but it just uh, it just stood out to me that last year he kind of looked like he was lost out there. This year, he looks so much more polished. So it's obvious he's been working with uh, uh, wide receivers coach Curtis C.J. Johnson. I, I, I guarantee you, Curtis, uh, uh, Curtis Johnson has been working with Doral. 
uh, you know, because he's on the practice squad, so he's still part of the team. And, and look, uh, that, 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 that's something that stood out to me. So, you know, Will Durrell, yeah, I don't, you know, am I saying Traven Durrell's going to make the team? No, I'm not saying that. But, but that, that, that's just another example of a guy that stood out to me. Uh, so now let's get to Taysom Hill. Because everybody, uh, you know, invariably all the questions that I got on Facebook uh, and on uh, direct mes- message on Twitter, the majority of them are about Taysom Hill. What do you think? You know, you know, and obviously I've covered it in several uh, different different articles now. What I think about Taysom Hill and uh, and what it, about his chances of being a legitimate heir apparent to Drew Brees. Uh, it, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway I have. Besides the fact that he lacks accuracy, he's not a bad quarterback with regard to being a passer. Let's separate the two things first. <laughs> he's a fantastic athlete. I mean, it, I mean, this is a guy who could be could play running back. That's how good of an athlete he is. He's such a great athlete. He could, you know, obviously we knew he lined up with special teams and all the notable stuff he did last year. He is such a fantastic athlete that I truly believe he could play running back in the National Football League. Now, I'm not saying he'd be Le'Veon Le- Le- Bell or anything, but <laughs> I think he legitimately could play running back in the league. Uh, well, you know, would he, would he rush for 1,000 yards? Probably not. But he, he probably could, I could see the guy rushing for 850. I mean, he's that good. He's that great of an athlete. And uh, at BYU, if you go back and look at his career, he, that's why, uh, you know, he – uh, a lot of people, and I think this is, you know, some people are, are laughing when you hear this comparison, but you got to remember this is BYU, Brigham Young University. Think about the school, okay? So he's been compared to Steve Young, okay? Now, yeah, I know Steve Young went to the NFL Hall of Fame and, you know, won the Super Bowl with the 49ers. And, you know, that might sound, sound like a laughable comparison, but Steve Young is the great, 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 great grandson of Brigham Young, okay? <laughs> And, you know, uh, and we all know Steve Young had a fantastic career at BYU. So that's why the comparison has been made, not only because they went to a similar school and are both Mormon, but because Taysom Hill, like Steve Young, coming out of college, was a phenomenal athlete who could throw the ball as well as he could passing it. That's where the difference is, because Taysom Hill is not the passer that Steve Young was. Is he the runner that Steve Young is? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what makes him such an exciting player because he can keep plays alive with his feet. You saw it in, I saw it in practice. There, there were several times where the play broke down and he, and, and he, and he makes something out of nothing. And there, yeah, there's, un, there's no doubt in my mind after finally getting to see him in person that what they're excited about is the fact that he can extend plays. You know, he he he, he kind of like Russell Wilson. If there's a guy I wanted to compare him to, pro wise, it would be Russell Wilson because Russell Wilson never gives up on a play. So if you why if you watch Russell, and I'm not no see I'm not a Seahawks fan by any stretch, but if, but I admire Russell Wilson's play because he never gives up on a play. He'll hang in there and hang in there and hang in there and hang in there until it finally breaks down. And then when it does break down, he's a great enough athlete that he can keep, you know, that he can keep the drive alive because he'll go get that, you know, third and seven, he'll get to eight yards. You know, if it's third and 15, he'll get 16 somehow, either throwing it or running it. He'll, make, he'll just make a play and get that 16, 16 yards on third and 15. It, he just does. And uh, that is the potential, I think, they see with, with Hill as far as a, a scrambler and a runner. The problem is Russell Wilson can throw. Steve Young could throw. Taysom Hill hasn't gotten there yet. I, I, now, he, now, he's a decent passer, but he doesn't have the touch or an accuracy of a Drew Brees. <laughs> he doesn't even have the touch and the accuracy of a Garrett Grayson, in my opinion. Not yet. Not yet. I'm not saying he can't. Oh. I'm not, you know, again, let's remember. This is Drew Brees mentoring him. This is Sean Payton, the quarterback whisperer, so to speak, guiding him. So let's not write this kid off by any stretch. But uh, long story short, uh, he needs he needs a little bit more. T- he needs to get better 
Uh, certainly he needs to be more accurate and get a little more touch, so to speak, on the football. But he's not a bad passer. He's not bad. He's not, he's not wildly inaccurate uh, by any stretch. He, he, you know, I mean, the, he gets the ball there. Uh, the biggest thing that I see with his game, besides that he needs to be a little more accurate and get a little more touch on the, on the throws themselves, is his timing. And, and, now, and now think about this. Think about uh, when you're a quarterback and, you know, you, there, there's what you call, I would call an internal clock in your head. There's an internal clock that you have as a NFL quarterback where you know as soon as the ball is snapped, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. You know you got to that third Mississippi to get that ball out of there or you're going to get sacked. Sometimes you don't even have that. Sometimes you don't even have that long. You know, you got to, you know, you got to take the snap and bam, get it out your hand because there's guys breathing down your neck. So imagine that. Okay. So with Drew Brees, nine times out of 10, how many times do you see Drew Brees step back and just right when it seems he's about to get sacked, he get, he delivers that football and he delivers it right. Okay. Well, well, that's what Taysom Hill doesn't have yet. He doesn't have that internal clock. So, so when when it start when the pocket starts to break down, instead of hanging in there and, and waiting for that receiver to run that entire route, let that receiver finish and run in his entire route, he 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 panics. So he's either delivering the ball too soon, and, and the you know and the ball ends up being incomplete because not because he was inaccurate. Uh, the ball was still there in the vicinity of the receiver, and, he, and the receiver was open. But he didn't. He didn't give the guy enough time to finish running the route. So that's what you're seeing. That, to, or to me, that's my observation, especially in that first practice, is that he doesn't. Uh, he panics a little bit. He doesn't. He doesn't trust the process of uh, of the pot, You know, of the play developing yet. He, he's, he's he's still in this mode where. Uh, he panics and, and he just takes off. You know, that, I'm sure that's what he did a lot of at BYU is whenever the play would break down, he would just take off and run. And, you know, when you get that many rushing touchdowns as he got at BYU, it, there's a good reason to do it, apparently, <laughs> because apparently nobody in the Mountain Mountain West Conference could stop him. So, well, Barry, uh, and that's, that's actually what I wanted to ask you about, too. Uh, we watched a lot of film on – Taysom Hill when the Saints uh, brought him over from Green Bay after his release last preseason. Uh, and BYU's system is predicated this way, so it's not a knock on Hill. Uh, it looked like an offensive system, pretty much a pistol. You take one read, and then if it's not there, you take off and run. Uh, but one right. thing that I have noticed about Hill, if I had a criticism, my, my number one criticism of him was an elongated release which, of course, is going to throw off the timing uh, of your receivers, allow your defensive backs to make a play on the ball. In your observations of him at camp practices, uh, does it look like that uh, Peyton and uh, Pete Carmichael and Drew Brees have been working with him? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely have. I I would, I mean, because I, like I said, I didn't get to see him at all last year, so I don't know what they were looking at last year. But just comparing comparing what what we've seen on film from BYU and then because uh, I because I've you know I've seen the film uh, from the pre, uh, Green Bay preseason as well. He just seems to me like he's got, from from watching that and then seeing what I saw in practice, he looks a little more polished. Now I wouldn't say that it's overwhelming by any stretch, and he's certainly a uh, I don't want to call him a project because that that's not fair to call, call a kid a project, but. Uh, he, he the, the, uh, uh, I guess I guess the the most accurate uh, depiction I could give is that the the kid that has the potential to be to be a legitimate starting quarterback, but it ha- but it has to be developed, and he has to he has he has he has to be willing. There's a got to be a willingness on his part to listen and and and, and take this guidance from Peyton and Breeze. And, and take it to heart and implement it into into what he does because it's it's like I said again uh, it's obvious how much physical talent he has but uh, his uh, his ultimate success or failure you you were just talking about the elongated delivery uh, you know it's it's those little technical flaws of his game that that will ultimately determine his success or failure because if he can learn you know if he can learn, if he can get the timing down. 
uh, for example. I mean, Ed, look, if he gets the timing down, if he gets if he gets that internal clock, so to speak, in the back of his head, if Breeze show, shows him how to do that, watch out because he, you know he, he he's a much better. At, yeah, if you, if you think Drew, you know, we always talk about how great of an athlete Drew Brees is. But Drew Brees ain't another. He's not even half the athlete Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill is. That, that's how much at talently, uh, athletically gifted that Taysom Hill is. Again, uh, I think he could play legitimately play a running back. That's how good of an athlete he is. He could play wide receiver probably if he was fast enough. I mean, he's just that good. So. Uh, you know, it, it's just a matter of, of, of if he if he really takes this to heart. You know, I, look, I, I have people ask me all the time, "Well, why you know, why don't you think Garrett Garrett Grayson didn't work out?" Personally, I don't think Garrett. Uh, I, I don't think it was a matter of of IQ or grasping the offense. I just don't know if Garrett Grayson took it to heart. I just don't know if he. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to explain because I mean, since he got released, he hasn't done anything. So it, I guess that legitimizes, uh, you know, everything that happened with him. You know, it's a shame that they wasted the pick on him, but you know, it, it just sometimes you, sometimes your evaluations aren't great. Remember, look, Sean Payton thought Garrett. He went to he flew to Colorado Springs, uh, like two days prior to the draft to go watch Garrett Grayson work out at a private workout in Colorado Springs. So he was very high on Garrett Grayson, and it, the kid just didn't work out. And then you get somebody like Taysom Hill just fall into his lap, basically, because, you know, you, they weren't even looking at Taysom Hill. You know, they, did, they discovered him by accident while they were trying to look at another guy that Green Bay had gotten rid of. So, you know, that's just the way things work out sometimes. Um, you know, you know, he might – he might have been a guy that, uh, you know, if Green Bay didn't sign him last year, maybe the Saints would have gave him a shot if he was out there. Who knows? But uh, I just feel like if if he takes this to heart and he he takes this with a serious approach, which it seems to be uh, based on everything that you've seen in the interviews and you listen to him talk or whatever, he, he is. He He's very serious about it. I mean, this, you know, I thought that, you know, I'll be totally honest with both y'all. I thought this was a big joke, <laughs> you know, last year. I really did. I was like, give me a break. This kid, yeah, this kid ain't the heir apparent, you know. And here I am, you know, almost a year later, and I, I'm eating my words because, uh, you know. Now, no, again, let's let's see what he looks like in the preseason games. Let, let's, let's not oversell it, you know, because when it's all said and done, would would not shock me one bit if Tom Savage is still your number two quarterback. When it, when 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 they play Tampa Bay, so I don't I don't want to oversell it, but uh, the the long story the long story short, and I'm, I apologize for getting long winded on you guys tonight, but I always get long winded. Uh, you guys know that. Um, long story short, uh, you know if he if if he can work out the little kinks that he still has in his game, but basically on accuracy, touch, and timing, those three things. If he gets those three things down, which again with Sean Payton and Drew, Drew Brees guiding him shouldn't be an issue. It's all about him grasping what he's being taught. You know, uh, you know. Think about you know when you're a kid in school, you know, and 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 your your elementary school is trying to teach you cursive writing. You know, it's something so simple that we take for granted as adults. But as a little kid, it was a daunting task to learn how to write in, in cursive or, or, you know, so think of it from, you know, uh, just think of it in those type of terms. If, Gar- you know, so uh, I'm almost at Garrett Grayson. If Taysom Hill uh, can learn how to write in cursive and not just print his name, <laughs> a bad analogy, I know. But if, if Taysom Hill can learn how to write his name in script or in cursive and not just print his name, then he's going to, he's going to be successful. So we'll see. Uh, you know, well, I, you know. Now let me get to the disappointments real quick, and then we'll let you get to your next topic. Biggest disappointment, not because they looked bad, but just because they didn't participate. So it, 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 the camp was all it was, like I said, it was all they they canceled the third day. Uh, the second day was abbreviated, so I only really got to see them legitimately go full speed practice in that one practice and, and basically where I made all these observations, but all three days or all or the two days that I got to go because the third day got canceled. 
uh, Michael Thomas didn't participate at all. He had an excused absence. We we don't know, still don't know why, but basically because of what I've seen him doing on Twitter in the last few days, I I, I know him and the team are in great on great terms. They're doing for, you know because I had somebody say, oh God I hope Michael Thomas and this and Saints management you they're going to hold out no 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 so he he basically just had an excuse he probably just asked to have it all. He probably just said, look, can I have mini camp off? Because I just don't want to do it. You know, I've been here for OTAs. I, I'll be ready for training camp. But, I, you know, I, you, I don't know what the reasons were that they never did say. But the, the, the disappointment was that I never got to see him because, uh, you know, he's had such a great, great off season so far. And you've seen him on Twitter. He's jacked. He's all cut from stone. So I was just, I was just really looking forward to seeing him. And he, did, he, didn't, he didn't participate. The other guy I wanted to see really participate was um, Dion Yeldo, the tight end. And again, uh, another guy that didn't participate, so I didn't get to see him uh, perform. And then I would say that the other disappointment, not because he played badly, but just because he just was limited to snaps, which is JT Barrett, the third string quarterback, for, uh, for, for, or the fourth string quarterback, technically. Uh, out of Ohio State, um, they yeah, drafted free agent that a lot of Saints fans are very hyped on. Um, but I didn't really get to see. He, I mean, he basically, when they were running quarterback drills, Breeze would take. You know, uh, if they were doing, let's say, if, uh, if they took twenty snaps in, Q, in QB drills, Breeze got fifteen. Uh, oh no, I, I scratch that. Breeze probably got. Uh, let's say Breeze got ten. Savage probably got five. Hill got five. Barrett got one. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I don't know if that's that. I, I, I'm sure that's not the actual, the actual breakdown. But so basically, you know, uh, Breeze was getting the majority of snaps. Uh, Savage would get the second most snaps. Hill, Hill would probably get right around the same snaps as Savage did. And then Barrett was pretty much just watching. And, and they might give him the token snap here or there. So there, there's definitely a pecking order. Um, so if you're, if you're a JT Barrett fan, don't don't get too disappointed. Don't build your stuff up on it because it's obvious the Saints. Have, I mean, he'll he'll get to compete in camp, but he's not going to beat out Taysom Hill, and I don't think he can beat out Tom Savage. I, I know a lot of Saints fans think, "Oh, Savage will get cut because they didn't know." No, they won't. They're not going to cut Savage for for Barrett. They're not. They're just not going to do that. So I, my prediction for JT Barrett is that they'll try to put him on the practice squad. I don't know if that's going to be possible or not. I don't know how many other NFL teams would generally have interest in JT Barrett if the Saints were to cut him or release him. So I don't, I'm not sure how that would work out if they try to run him through waivers uh, on final on the on the final cut down and then hope to you know re-sign him immediately to the practice squad. I don't know if they would get away with that. I, I, I guarantee you they couldn't do it with Trayvon Durrell this year. Somebody will pick up Trayvon Durrell this year. So. You know, would that happen with Barrett too? I don't know. I can't say that. But uh, you know, it's fun. But I had a lot of Saints fans. How did Barrett look? I don't know because he didn't do. He really didn't do anything. All he do is he took a snap and turn around and hand off the ball. Yeah, I think he might have threw it once. You know, <laughs> so I mean, I don't know. I you know, this is I. This is what I can tell you. JT Barrett's going to get a lot, a lot of work in the preseason. And I guarantee you, you'll see him a lot in the second half, probably of of a lot of the preseason games. So we'll get to see we'll get to see more of Barrett, you know, in the preseason. But I, I, I just want to caution fans who are, you know, making him the next Warren Moon, basically. <laughs> uh, you know, let let's slow your roll. Let's slow your roll big time because, you know, could J T. Barrett be the quarterback in the Saints' future? Some people speculate. Who knows? But it ain't going to be this year. I can assure you of that. Well, and I know that there's, uh, I know that there's some things that we didn't get to tonight, you know, Saints fans. But remember, we still have three weeks before uh, the beginning of training camp, and then of course four weeks of preseason. Uh, right. But I did want to end the show uh, with this, and I know all three of us uh, feel the heartache in the football world. <clears throat> the football football world lost a great one this week. Uh, a terrific football coach, but even a better person, uh, Coach Rick Gale, uh, a, a friend of all of ours and a friend of many. 
uh, passed away after a long battle uh, with cancer uh, this past week. And our condolences go out to uh, the family and close friend, uh, friends of Coach Gale. Uh, Coach, I mean, I, I miss you. I didn't get to know you very long, uh, but you were always extremely supportive and encouraging of everything that I was trying to do. Uh, you, I could see why the ultimate compliment, speaking as a coach, the ultimate compliment that a coach could hear would be, I'd play for you. And Coach, I'll play, I'd play for you. Uh, and I want to thank you for everything that you've, you know, you've meant to me and thank you for everything that you've meant to the football world. Uh, Kyle Berry, I know you knew coach a lot better than I did. Uh, so I, I wanted to get my condolences out of the way first. Barry, go ahead. Uh, it's kind of hard for me right now, but Barry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah. And, and, and I know how close you were to him, Kyle. So, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll try to be the uh, the um, the the uh, the voice of, of calm here. <laughs> uh, it's hard for me to. Uh, he he was just such a great guy, you know. And uh, you know, I, unfortunately, I never got to meet him in person, but I knew knew him from uh, doing these shows. And uh, obviously, I knew. Uh, and for those Saints fans who who don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about uh, a Louisiana high school football coaching legend. Uh, Coach Rick Daly started off um, uh, actually is, is uh, a three-time All-American golfer of all things. I, a lot of people don't realize he was a championship golfer in the city of New Orleans. Uh, he, uh, he uh, well now it's called University of New Orleans. UNO uh, is the school where he went to. But back in those days, in the early 1970s, it was referred to as LSUNO. Uh, Louisiana State University at New Orleans, uh, which eventually morphed into the school that is now the uh, University of New Orleans Privateers. Uh, well, anyway, Coach uh, Rick Gailey at the time was student athlete Rick Gailey and uh, a three-time All-American golfer. So think, you know, think of Tiger Woods when Tiger Woods went to Stanford and, and was an All-American. Well, back in the early 1970s, uh, Rick Gailey was a uh, three-time All-American uh, NCAA championship golfer for the University of New Orleans. So that's where he made his first um, impact in the sporting world. But, uh, and he could have played. Rick Gailey could have been a PGA golfer. Yeah, I mean, he could be on the PGA. He could have been on the PGA Seniors Tour, uh, you know, right before he passed. I mean, he, he was that good. He was legitimately that good of a golfer that he could have played on the PGA tour. He could have played with Jack Nicholas. He could have played with Arnold Palmer. He could have played with all those guys, but he just chose not to. He didn't want to, he, for whatever reason, he just didn't want to be a PGA golfer. And, and, and uh, Hey, I respect him for that. I never did ask him. I, I always wanted to ask him why not, why not be a, you know, if you could play with Jack Nicholas and Arnold, Arnold Palmer, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, but and I never got to ask him. But uh, his his good good friend, Mr. Ken Trahan, who uh, if he ever gets to hear the show, uh, was uh, like Kyle was very close to him. And uh, I know I saw uh, Ken Trahan the other night explain it uh, that uh, he just wanted to become a coach. He loved uh, he he liked that the, the prospect of becoming a coach because not only was he a championship golfer, but he also loved obviously he loved the sport of football. Uh, I mean, he loved many sports. He, he loved baseball. I mean, there, there were several sports that he loved, but the sport of football just attracted him so much that he, that he, he wanted, he, he knew he wasn't big enough physically to be a football player, but, he, but he just had such a love and a passion for the sport and, a, and, and the, the concepts of it and the knowledge. And, and another thing, uh, and we'll get to it in a minute, but coach Gailey was just one of the most, Smartest, I, I, I'm talking IQ wise. I'm talking IQ uh, uh, intelligence wise. When you spoke to him, he just, I mean, he was just such a knowledgeable and such a well learned guy. And I ain't just talking about sports, I'm talking about in every aspect of life. And, and, and you name it, he knew something about it. And, and not just a little, I mean, he knew extensive knowledge of certain topics. I mean, you were like, 
you were like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why, where did this guy know all that? I mean, it's like he was an encyclopedia or something. I mean, he just had so much knowledge. And, 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 and not just not just about certain topics, sort of, but just about life in general. He could give you advice. Uh, and that's what made him such a great coach. That's what made players love him and respect him as highly respected and loved as he was is because of, he was such a, uh, a hands-on uh, type of guy. Uh, you talk to all his former players or former assistant coaches that coached under him, and they, and they all tell you it was his attention to detail, but it was also his, his love, his genuine love and, and concern for his, his athletes, for his students. You know, he just, he, man, there, there just, there just so many, uh, you know, there's been such an out, outpouring of emotion and, uh, respect, uh, for him the last few days. And I've heard countless stories of so many people's lives that he touched, including ours here at Saints News Network. And, 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 and I'm just amazed by, by all the, the little, the little bitty stories that I hear from, from former players or former assistant coaches or whatever. Uh, he just had an impact, a profound impact on so many people. Uh, but long story short, uh, he didn't want to become a professional golfer. So he got into to the coaching business. Uh, uh, he originally coached uh, on the uh, staff at uh, Tulane University uh, in the early 1980s uh, 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 under head coach. I think it was Wally, Wally English, I believe it was. Um, and, uh, well, first it was Vegas, Vegas Vince Gibson, uh, a famous, uh, uh, Tulane university coach in the early 1980s. Uh, so he was, uh, he was on his staff, uh, with Vegas Vince and then, uh, uh, Wally, Wally English, I think was the coach after Vegas Vince Gibson. And he remained on Wally, Wally English's staff on his offensive coaching staff. Uh, and as soon as Wally English uh, left Tulane, I think Mac Brown took over. And so when Mac Brown took over, that's when Coach Gailey left Tulane. Uh, he first went to Chalmette High School, uh, where, where I used to live uh, a couple years, a uh, long time ago, back when I was growing up in New Orleans. Um, uh, he, so he coached at Chalmette High. Then I think he went to Rummel High School for a couple years. But then after he left Rummel High School, he made his mark at St. James High School. Which is in the river, uh, what's known as the New Orleans River Parishes. For those fans listening who uh, aren't from the New Orleans area, there's what they call the river, the surrounding river parishes of New Orleans, which is St. John the Baptist, St. James, uh, St. Charles, uh, all the little parishes that surround uh, the, the greater New Orleans area, which is Orleans, Jefferson, and St. Bernard, St. Tammany, all that. Well, anyway. Coach Gailey became the head coach at St. James High School. And um, uh, he was there for 19 years, went to nine state semifinal games, and went to the Louisiana High School football class 5A state championship game three times. Uh, Unfortunately, they lost all three. But uh, but that was his legacy. So you're talking about a coach. a high school football coaching legend. Uh, out of 19 seasons, I want to say they made the playoffs 16 times, which is just a phenomenal, phenomenal accomplishment. So, uh, long story short, he was a high school coaching legend in the state of Louisiana. Uh, he basically, I mean, when he got to St. James, they were, uh, I hate to say this, uh, I hope people at St. James High listen to right now, don't get offended, but they were garbage. That 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 high school football program was garbage when he got there, and within a couple of years' time, they were they were beating Destrehan. I mean, if for anybody that knows that area of of the of the river parishes, Destrehan rules the river parishes. Their their football program was was number one. And when Coach Scaly got to St. James, he had St. James competing. Every year, it was Destrehan and St. James, Destrehan, St. James, Destrehan, St. James. I mean, it was always the, and that was because of Coach Rick Gailey. Before he got there, <laughs> St. James was a laughing stock. It wasn't nobody, wasn't nobody worried about St. James because they were so god awful. They were one and nine, zero oh and ten, two and eight. Nobody cared about St. James, 
And when Coach Gailey got there, he, he just t- changed the entire culture of the school, of the alumni, of all that. And now they're they're you know they're one of the top uh, high school football programs in southeastern Louisiana and have been for some time. And it's all because of Coach Ray Gailey. So, Coach, uh, I, I can only speak on my personal <clears throat> behalf and just say, um, you know, all my interactions with you on Saints News Network were uh, very, very uh, informative. They were fruitful. I learned so, so much. I, I, I can't tell you how many times that I listened to him on a radio show on a Wednesday night here at Saints News Network and incorporated what I had heard from him or heard him say the night before and then turn around and put it in my article the next the next morning at Big Easy Believer and, and now here at Saints News Network. So, uh, you know, uh, I, you know I, 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 I know that uh, I'm going to try to make the services, uh, his services are on Sunday at the Jacob Shane Funeral Home on uh, Canal Boulevard, I believe, which is in mid-city New Orleans. I'm going to try to make it if I can. Uh, but if I don't make it, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly want to wish, wish, uh, uh, his wife Elaine and, uh, all the family, uh, my condolences. And, uh, he was a great, great man. And, uh, <clears throat> he'll be missed. He'll be missed greatly, uh, here at Saints News Network. Without a doubt. And Kyle, I think it's only right that, that you close us out with your thoughts. I knew you were, you and, uh, you and coach were very close. <clears throat> First of all, thank you uh, to the Gailey family for allowing us to be a part of his life and uh, to his wife, Elaine, and the rest of his family. You're in my prayers and a lot of people prayers and uh, uh, to be comforted to knowing that. But um, he was well loved, man, and. Very few people live their life on purpose and he lived his life on purpose with a purpose and his purpose was fulfilled. Um, Mm -hmm. Coach and I formed a friendship through Facebook. Matter of fact, (laughs) it's funny. Um, I would ask a question here and there. He would answer. And uh, one day, I believe around five, six years ago, I, I, I asked him to to, uh, to have a guest spot on our Wednesday night program. And uh, he joined us, and the rest was history. Um, he was a great source of information, like you said, Barry. He talked many Saints fans off the ledge of the Crescent city <laughs> connection. <laughs> um, you know, and, and professor used to always say it, Hey dad. And we would call him our coach dad. That's who he was to us. That's how endearing he was to us. Dad. Uh, we, we need, we need you. We just need to talk. I'll ask him questions offline. He was always accommodating. If I needed to make a major decision, even with the network, he was there to listen and gave me his his opinion, his honest opinion, man. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't being paid. He just wanted to be here. And he he would say, like, Kyle T, I just, just want to be with you guys, man. And I know last season he was fighting through the chemo and the other treatments that he was uh he was uh, being administered to fight through the cancer and things were looking promising at one time. I know he was encouraging and encouraging us. You know, that was one thing also, Barry. Remember, he was encouraging a lot of people through his messages, through Facebook, uh, giving an update on his 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 um, his treatment and how he's responding. And mm-hmm. in April. I was going to try to get a chance to see him and he wanted to uh, go to church and take the sacrament that Sunday morning. 
and I was mm-hmm. going to try to get a chance to see him on the way back, you know, off of I-10. And I say, you know, it's a quick jaunt just to go, you know, come over there and see how you're doing. Because we never had a chance to really officially meet face-to-face. Right. And uh, he just wasn't feeling up to it. He wasn't feeling well. And I understood, man. And um, But he said, Kyle T., yeah. It's on my bucket list that we meet. <laughs> <laughs> he, that's what he said. His, I was like, well, all right, yeah. coach. And I uh, checked on him. Uh, I, I know last month, right before, he, he kind of went silent for a while, and I knew something was going on. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all I want to say is this, man. You have a person like Coach Rick Gailey in your life, you're blessed. And on the Saints yeah. News Radio Network, Saints News Network, or whatever, he he was always there to 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 be there. And I was pleased and happy I was able to produce and co-host his From the Coach's Office podcast. And most of the, the nights it was he and I just talking. That was, mm-hmm. man, that was great, man. It was just he and I just having conversations. And I, and I know sometimes the professor would come on in and, and chime in, but he always had a logical, sense-worthy way of explaining the game, explaining life, like you said, Barry, right? And mm-hmm. also yeah. being yeah. able to just have the right, words to make sense. It was almost like he almost knew the right thing to say. He just, yeah. he, he, even when you, if you doubted yourself or, or, yeah, bear, or bear. just whatever, if you had a, if you, if you needed a, uh, an answer to a question or a solution to a problem, he had it. Yeah. <laughs> he just had it. Yeah. And you know, Barry, and Bob and yeah. Barry and the rest of the listeners, it's pretty emotional for me. Number one, because last year we lost the professor. Yeah. This year we lose coach. And those two were really two individuals I really counted on. Uh, and, and yeah, yeah, they were, they were, they were key contributors to our, to our network. And, uh, you know, to lose both of them in back-to-back years is just tough. And, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to persevere. We'll, 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 Barry, we'll Barry, 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 uh, let me just get this out, bro. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I got to get this out. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, he's just a great person. And to lose both of those guys – I know we're on the right direction. We have great talent like Bob, Barry, uh, and the rest of the Saints News crew. But one thing I just want to share with you guys, if you ever have a chance to go back and listen to some of the old broadcasts or even some of the old things that he, that he did with Ed Daniels and Ken Trahan and John Forcade uh, and those guys with the Three Tailgaters show, um, you know, and I would call in sometimes on Saturday mornings to talk with those guys. And but also, what what's going to be missing in Louisiana? His knowledge of the prep game. Oh, yeah, he was such a wealth of knowledge of the prep sports game in Louisiana, not just New Orleans area, yeah. in Louisiana, and uh, oh, that's thanks. why he's a legend. Yeah. And um, I'm going to miss you, Coach. We're going to miss you, but you've left such a great imprint and uh, impact on our lives. You just planted seeds. That's how I I look at it. You planted great seeds that I'm praying that those seeds take fertile root and grow and plant other seeds in other people as well. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you, my friend, for just being a great, great person. And what he used to always say, Bob, um, and Saints <laughs> fans, uh, special teams need to be special, <laughs> right? If a, a team yeah. is going to win, special teams need to be special. Well, 
you were part of our special team, and you definitely were special, Coach. Thank you so much. I love you. That's it. Hey, such eloquent words, Kyle. Um, I I don't think we need to expound anymore. Um, you know, Rick, you meant a ton to us. Um, and, and to echo Kyle's sentiment, thank you. I just thank you, and and we love you, and we will miss you. Uh, Pray for the family. Pray for the family. Yes. Keep. Yes. Uh, and you know, know, know that it, you know if you folks are listening, know that we we are here for you. Um, I, I might be, I might just be one of those uh, seeds uh, that Kyle was talking about and didn't get to know Coach very well. But he touched my life and he touched it very profoundly. Um, so if, you know, y'all need anything from any of us, just just reach out. Uh, and you know, Saints listeners, uh, fans of the Bayou Blitz, thank you for tuning us in uh, again on Wednesday night. And I hope you all had a terrific Fourth uh, of July. And thank you for making us part of your fourth. Uh, Barry, thank you for joining us uh, as our guest tonight. Uh, you want to tell folks how to find you real quick? Uh, I'm sure. You can reach me uh, uh, at, uh, just go to saintsnewsnetwork.com. Um, we're getting close to football season now, as, uh, as Saints fans obviously are eagerly uh, anticipating. Uh, so I'm going to get back to pretty much writing every day uh uh starting this week and uh i'm gonna be uh probably ramping that up uh hopefully uh it looks like i might be finally uh adding some new writers to our staff uh we're, we're expanding our staff this year and uh hopefully uh we'll be getting you guys a little more additional content but regardless of whether, whether whether i get a few more guys or not uh we there's always going to be daily content uh, now that I'm here back in New Orleans, uh, back home, I'll be uh, at Saints camp every day. So you'll you'll be getting my my um, uh, latest uh, news and notes and observations from every practice. Uh, and of course, we'll be covering the team daily here uh, once the season starts. So I'm looking forward to that. You can so, but again, SaintsNewsNetwork.com, or you can uh, look me up on Twitter at. Barry Hurstus, and that's spelled, uh, the last name is spelled H-I-R-S-T-I-U-S, pronounced Hurstus. And uh, you can find all my articles and hopefully the articles of some new staff uh, members here coming up very soon uh, at Saints News Network. Um, Kyle, you want to take us out this evening? Well, Bob, thank you uh, so much, and Barry, my man from Harahan, uh, <laughs> you, you're doing a great job with the Saints News Network, uh, but uh, don't forget, Saints fans, you can always check us out on saintspodcast.com, and you can listen to all of the past broadcasts for the Bayou Blitz. Uh, you can also check Barry out, like you said, on www.saintsnewsnetwork.com, but you can also look at all the Saints News across the internet on www.saintsnews.net. To the Gailey family, Miss Elaine, the rest of the extended family, and the people in the St. James Parish area, as well as uh, Ken Trahan, Ed Daniels, and those guys, as well as Mike Detillier, who was also a close friend of uh, yes. Coach. Uh, we're praying for you because I know how it is to lose a, a close friend. Uh, this one is it's hard, uh, but but also you have to rejoice in the life that he lived. Saints fans, yes. you guys be with them, be with the family, listen in uh, to us next Wednesday night. Uh, be with Bob as well. But uh, just keep supporting what we're trying to do. We're trying to get, deliver Remember, we're fans delivering the best for you, the fan, as well. Um, yep. Support us, the network. Uh, right now, we need a little bit more support, so we're we're going to ask that if you can help us with any contributions you can to, to just be out there and look out for what we're trying to do and trying to be able to grow uh, with 
everything that we do, not only with the podcast, but also on the website. So to the Gailey family, to uh, Saints fans, and um, just know that we love you guys and Saints fans and who that's. Take care and have a great 4th of July, rest of the 4th of July. And remember, a lot of people, 4th of July is not just a holiday. It means freedom, people. Freedom. Amen. Have a great one. Take care.